Hello, everyone, and welcome to the life and legacy of Sir Roger Scruton, the online launch event for the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. My name is Fisher Dardarian, and I am the executive director uh, here at the foundation. I'm so pleased that you could join us off for such a momentous occasion and for what promises to be a great discussion on Roger Scruton and his ongoing importance today. Held by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson as the greatest modern conservative thinker and by the Wall Street Journal as the most influential conservative thinker since Edmund Burke, Sir Roger Scruton was a leading philosopher of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Scruton held numerous posts at universities and think tanks uh, across the US and UK and was a prolific author, having written some 50 books. Not only was he a philosopher of the highest caliber, but he was a man committed to living out the truth as much as he was to writing about it. Before his passing, Roger was honored by the Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary for the work he did in actively supporting Soviet dissidents throughout Central and Eastern Europe and for his contributions to those countries thereafter. I think Mark Dooley says it best when he describes Roger as a philosopher of love. Although Roger falls within that great tradition of conservative writers who could write a stirring lament and evoke a real sense of loss about the current degradation of our cultures and societies, his life and work was a testament to an opposite state of affairs. That with true love and care, those traditional ways of meaning we once had can be found again and revived. His settling on a farm and making it his home is one clear example of Roger embracing his English heritage and turning it into a living tradition. One of Roger's great virtues was his ability not only to identify the maladies of modern man, but also offer some prescription as to how we might overcome the culture of repudiation that has so seized this present moment by returning to our great patrimony. To, excuse me, to paraphrase a comment of his from one of his books, The West and the Rest, a culture of repudiation is a culture built on negation. And eventually our protesters, having torn down all they can, will have nothing to resent except one another. As more people become disillusioned with our present predicament, a guide back to the tacit knowledge we once knew as a society will be needed. And Roger is one of the finest lodestars we have. The Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation is the result of conversations Roger and I began back in May 2018 when I was a student of his at the University of Buckingham. He had kindly invited me to his flat in London to discuss this strange idea I'd proposed of starting a US-based organization dedicated to building up programs uh, around him and his work. We continued to work on it the following year and a half, developing what it stood for and the activities it would undertake up until the final weeks of his life. Although our plans changed when he passed away all too soon in January this year, I have found many of his former colleagues, friends, and supporters from all over the world that, like me, think Roger Scruton is a man most worthy of our admiration and of a prominent and lasting legacy. The Foundation's mission statement is to establish Scruton's legacy through the conservation, care, and continuation of traditional wisdom and culture. Like Roger, our goal is to bring about a change so that the motivating spirit of our societies is one of oikophilia, a term Roger coined, meaning a love of our shared home and create a culture, a culture of gratitude where as an Edmund Burke's social contract, we the living are connected to the dead and the unborn by conserving the precious inheritance that we have received from those who have passed before us for those who have yet to be born. Through the hosting and sponsoring of events like this one, we aim to support those dedicated to Scruton's vision of philosophy, music, art, architecture, and literature, and pass on our great tradition to the rising generations. To that end, we have an exciting lineup for you today to mark the launch of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. First, we'll be hearing a brief remark from Lady Scruton before our featured speakers, Roger Kimball and Douglas Murray. Roger Kimball is editor and publisher of The New Criterion and president and publisher of Encounter Books. He is an art critic for National Review and writes regular columns at, the American, at American Greatness, The Spectator USA, and The Epic Times. Roger's most recent book is The Fortunes of Permanence, Culture and Anarchy in an Age of Amnesia, published in 2012. Douglas is an author and journalist based in Britain. Since 2012, Douglas has been associate editor at The Spectator and is a regular contributor to National Review. Douglas's latest publication, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race, and Identity, was a bestseller and was named Book of the Year for the Times and the Sunday Times. There will be a Q&A uh, at the end, so please submit your questions through the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I ask that when you submit them, you do include where you're writing from so we know uh, where you are and we can include that when we read the question off. I'll be monitoring it throughout Roger and Douglas's conversation and we'll be choosing a few to answer with the time that we have. 
I now have the pleasure of inviting Lady Scruton, one of our founding members of the board of directors and Sir Roger's widow to say a few words. Sophie. Hello, thank you very much, Fisher. I am delighted that the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation has been formed. I hope its work will inspire and encourage people who share Roger's commitment to conservative ideas and people who are committed to work for conservative causes. I hope it will support programs that bring philosophy alive in the way that Roger was able to do for the subject. It is great that one of his recent philosophy students, Fischer de Derrien, is the founder of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. We are lucky to have so many beautifully written books to treasure, read, and if you, like me, have not read everything yet, to discover. I look forward to seeing the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation support further work in areas Roger loved and defended, such as the aesthetics of architecture. But now I can't wait to hear a discussion between Douglas Murray, whose bold writing does so much to clarify questions that conservatives must address, and Roger Kimball, who does so much to uphold high culture and to support academic freedom. So Roger, I think you are next to speak. I look forward to it, thank you. Well, thank you, Sophie, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, many of you can probably see me on your screen and you might be wondering if I'm speaking to you from England, but alas, no, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Connecticut, but I decided to put an image of Dover Beach behind me, myself, uh, thinking that that was an appropriate uh, image uh, for our discussion of Roger Scruton. After all that melancholy long withdrawing roar of the sea of faith, that Matthew Arnold invoked was something that uh, Roger spoke of often. And indeed, one of his books is called The Philosopher on Dover Beach. Um, I, I, I was just speaking to, uh, to Douglas Murray uh, before um, uh, we went live. And uh, to my astonishment and, and uh, uh, trepidation, perhaps, I realized that uh, I've known Douglas for 20 years, and the occasion for our meeting uh, came from Roger and Sophie, who wrote me uh, back in the year 2000, just when Douglas's book on Lord Alfred Douglas was coming out, to commend him to me. And uh, we have been uh, allies uh, of a sort uh, ever since. Um, we published one of his books uh, at Encounter Books on neoconservatism and uh, look forward perhaps to uh, publishing more in the future. But uh, I'm, I'm really so grateful to the Scrutons for having introduced me to Douglas because he is a man who uh, really embodies many of the, many of the virtues that Roger uh, taught. And I use the word taught advisedly because I think of, among all of Roger's accomplishments, the fact that he was uh, a philosopher of the first water, that he was uh, a ferocious polemicist, that he was uh, an able composer. He wrote novels, he wrote operas. Uh, uh, he he, he uh, wrote beautifully about wine. Uh, I, I treasure his book, I Drink, Therefore I Am. Uh, how much better it would have been had Descartes' uh, uh, formula been bibo ergo sum rather than cogito ergo sum, I drink, therefore I am. But that's, uh, we'll leave that in the, the nostalgic mists. Uh, he was a rider to hounds, so, so many things. But I think, uh, lo looking back over his life, I think that perhaps the, his highest vocation was as a teacher. And I know so many people um, who, uh, who regard him as a, a mentor, someone who did, wasn't, he wasn't that he taught them um, the subject of philosophy or the niceties of Kant or Wittgenstein, although he did that as well. But he understood as Socrates understood 
that um, uh, and it, it is a famous scene at the beginning of the Republic where he says, Glaucon, these are not ordinary matters we're talking about, but rather the right conduct of life. How should we live our life? What is the good life? That was the animating question, I think, behind all that Roger did, whether it was in music, uh, uh, philosophy, uh, his novels, uh, his political activism in the 1980s, uh, all sorts, all sorts of, um, of disparate activities. <clears throat> but um, uh, I, I'm really very happy to have this occasion to, to, to meet uh, virtually with some of Roger's uh, admirers and, uh, and, and especially with, with Douglas, um, because it seems to me that we are now going through a moment, not unlike that moment in the late 1960s when Roger uh, found himself in Paris, uh, 1968, the, uh, the city was exploding. And he recounts in a uh, famous essay called uh, How I Became a Conservative or Why I Became a Conservative, uh, how the spectacle of mindless violence and destruction uh, disgusted him and uh, uh, turned him from his uh, youthful flirtation with socialism into a conservative. And uh, uh, how, how I wish that Roger were, were with us today to, uh, uh, to comment on some of the mindless destruction and uh, uh, socialistically uh, inspired violence that we see tearing our cities apart in the United States. It, it is indeed a, a, destructive, a destructive spectacle. Um, but Douglas, I, I, wonder, uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about this aspect of we'll get to other things as well, but this aspect of of Roger's uh, life and teaching and work. I'm not sure that you're unmuted there, Douglas. At least I cannot hear you. To unmute. Ah, thank you. There you are. Waiting to be unmuted by the host. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you to Fisher. Thank you to Sophie, uh, and and to Roger Kimball. It's enormous pleasure uh, to be able to join. Uh, you all and so many people with us online and so many people who will be watching uh, when this is uh, on YouTube in the uh, coming hours. Uh, it's an enormous uh, privilege to be involved with the uh, Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation uh, and a great honor and also a, a source of enormous hope at a time when, as, um, as Roger Kimball has just alluded to, I think hope it may be in short supply. Um, just to go back to one of the things which Roger has just referred to uh, about the current moment and about that seminal learning moment in, in Roger Scruton's own life and the events of Paris in 1968. One of the central things, of course, which he refers to in that essay and uh, which has been on, I'm sure, in all of our minds recently was that central insight he refers to uh, of how much easier it is to destroy than to build up. And that comes back to something I think which we're all, everyone who's watching, everyone who's with us today, is, is to some extent we are all involved in and partly involved in to greater, lesser extents uh, because of something that Roger Scruton taught in his life. I was very moved after uh, the funeral in Malmesbury in January uh, when somebody I didn't know wrote to me and sent an account that his, he hadn't been himself able to attend the funeral, but his girlfriend had been there. And she had described uh, uh, something I had missed, but uh, I was very moved by, which is she said how struck she was uh, on the day of the funeral of Roger Scruton in Malmesbury earlier this year, by the number of young men and women there were walking around Malmesbury that day with books in their hands. Um, all sorts of books. Some, some of them had some of Roger Scruton's books. Some of them had books by other people. Why was this so moving? Because it was a reminder of the building up that Roger was involved in in his life. And some people, uh, as he well knew, have testaments in architecture. And some people, himself included, have their testaments in books and in ideas. Uh, but one of the greatest testaments anyone can leave is that building up of people. And I would say of at least one, I would say several generations of people 
who looked to Roger then, and I think will for all of the rest of our lives, and I think many other people in the years to come will look to Roger and be in some ways part of his creation. That is, that we will have been people who have drunk from his work, uh, will have learned from his life, um, have warmed ourselves by the example he gave. And this is, it seems to me, one of the greatest gifts that any human being can give. Uh, and of course, it's a slow burner. Um, it's exactly a demonstration of that central insight that Roger wrote about in what he learned from the events of 1968. And something I think we can all learn from at the moment that, that yes, the act of burning down, of pulling down is so easy. Uh, it can be done in a moment. Uh, the fact that the building up takes so long is not itself, of course, an argument against building up. It's just one of the unfortunate and sad things of life that this is always the case. But yet building up can be done. And there are people I know who are with us uh, presently uh, on this uh, event, this launch in the fields of education in particular, who are daily involved in exactly that task. And uh, that task of, of building people up, of encouraging people, of showing them new ways of thinking is one of the things which I know uh, Roger in particular played such a large part in so many of our lives in showing us that way. And often, as, as you know, Roger, often, often with a, a very deft hand, uh, sometimes with a smarting stroke when he made it clear what avenues might not be worth uh, um, uh, going down. Uh, what subjects, what, what, what books might be right, right. not rewarding the effort. Uh, but always also that guiding of people, uh, his readers and in person as well, that guiding of people towards things which he suggested were indeed avenues worth exploring and which would reward the exploration. Right. Well, I, I remember uh, in one of his books, he, he says, you should read uh, A.J. Ayer's language, truth, and logic, but very quickly and inattentively. It's uh, <laughs> a marvelous comment. But you know, Fisher uh, mentioned two words that, that uh, or uh, uh, two phrases that I think um, uh, bear on our discussion. One is the culture of repudiation, mm. a phrase I think that Roger coined, uh, and oikophilia, the, the love of home. Um, the, that, that culture of repudiation really describes so many aspects of our, our current culture. Mm -hmm. Certainly it describes the hooligans on the street who have used the pretext of, of a, uh, uh, the, the death of, of, of George Floyd as an excuse to um, indulge in the most vicious sorts of, of, of anarchy. Uh, it really is an incredible um, spectacle of repudiation we see right. on 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 the some of the streets of some of our cities at the moment, uh, and, and I think that all of Roger's work really was uh, an effort to address and reverse that impulse of repudiation, hmm. and when he speaks of the the virtues of loving of of home, the oikophilia, that is in response to the the widespread oikophobia, the hatred mm. of home, that seems to characterize a certain strain of progressive, enlightened, left wing, uh, beautiful people who just so happen to run most of the institutions that govern our lives today. So there are many things I think that 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 flow from this. Uh, one one. Um, one has to do with, with freedom of speech, something that Roger was intimately uh, uh, involved with defending and uh, uh, whose own freedom of speech was uh, regularly, I think, uh, compromised by the guardians of so-called virtue who, couldn't, who were all for diversity just so long as you would happen to agree with them. It reminds me of something that, that uh, William F. Buckley Jr. said. He said that uh, liberals, by which he meant, of course, ill liberals, are all for um, uh, entertaining uh, 
diverse opinions in, 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 that, that contradict their own, but they're astonished to discover that there are people who actually entertain such conflicting opinions. Uh, well, that's, that's a very polite, uh, that's a polite um, uh, mode of repudiation. What we have seen in recent decades is something far more vicious. And Roger himself was the, was the victim of this. Um, uh, I, I know you were intimately involved in this episode, Douglas, and pro probably many of our listeners uh, know something about it. But since you were, were so close to it, perhaps you'd like to say a word or two about what happened to Roger uh, uh, after he gave an interview uh, with a wretched chap whose name I won't even utter at the New Statesman mm -hmm. uh, a year or so ago. Yes, uh, I, I will. I, we, sh we should skirt over this unfortunate incident as swiftly as possible, but uh, in order not to give any glee to, to, to the sort yes. of people who, who wish to do that. Yes, uh, of course, Roger had, as, 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 as you refer to it, throughout his, his career, been the subject of um, terrible and sometimes absolutely libelous attacks. Um, that perhaps wasn't completely surprising. Uh, um, and he certainly ended up, I think, being unsurprised by it. I thought that by the time the British government uh, uh, put him into this unpaid advisory position to head this commission into building beautiful, uh, um, that, that, that some of that started up and he, he said to me, it felt after that announcement was made of his appointment, it felt like the old anti scruton hate machine had been cranked back into motion. <laughs> He obviously felt it, it had been slightly less, less used in the years before. And of course, with his knighthood, uh, um, uh, long overdue, but with his knighthood, it was a, a demonstration in a way that, that, that the country really did have the gratitude uh, uh, for having him that it did have, it should have had. I, I think it was a surprise to him slightly. The old hate machine got, got back into gear momentarily. And then, yes, there was this terrible incident with a journalist who lied in, in the most vicious and, in the end, transparent way about him. Um, but that was that was righted, and and Roger was totally vindicated, and his his um, his detractor um, remains employed. But but I think his reputation is as is as low as it could be, quite rightly, as a result of this. And it shows that lies do have consequences. Um, but but yes, I mean, one of the interesting things about all this is that uh, um, many people say things that, that, that attract a vitriol, but there is a certain element, a certain depth of vitriol, which I think Roger could on occasion inspire, precisely because his enemies realized, realized how dangerous he was to them. Uh, and in a way, <laughs> there's no better tribute to somebody. Right. Than, than being recognized to be a really dangerous enemy to a really dangerous person. Uh, because uh, uh, what I think those people who were detractors of Rogers realized was that he wasn't any easy old pushover. He, he wasn't just firing off repudiations of, of uh, his opponents. He wasn't just uh, shooting down um, uh, sacred cows when they emerged or anything like that. Uh, he was, uh, throughout his uh, writing career, throughout his career as a, as a teacher, as a professor, as a, as a public figure, he was consistently exposing the vacuousness of his opponent's worldview. And this was very dangerous. It's very dangerous to them still. Um, he, he pointed to the, the deep underlying insecurities and indeed I'd say sadness, hollowness, at the root of the worldview of those who wished to attack him and lambast him, and in some cases still do, because he, he, was, he was able to reply in a way I think that very few, certainly conservative thinkers have done in our lifetimes. You mentioned one there, of course, William F. Buckley, but very few conservatives, I think, in our lifetimes have, have recognized the depth of the claim made by their left-wing opponents, uh, uh, and, and that this isn't just about a procedural issue, but there are reasons why specific left-wing ideas have caught on. There are specific 
uh, deep fallacies that have occurred. Um, and now Roger, of course, in many of his books, Thinkers of the New Left, that was reissued as uh, Fools, Frauds and Firebrands a few years ago, took these on, took the, some of the central texts of the postmodernists on in a way that nobody else had until very, very recently. He was way ahead of his time in, in, in doing that, taking it seriously, and indeed then pulling them apart, um, apart uh, deconstructing the deconstructionists, if you like. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. but, but also this recognition that the, the, the desire to do that, the desire of these people to be involved in such games must itself be fueled from somewhere. And that, and that one of the things that fueled that, of course, which he was so eloquent about was this, the whole principle of the whole risk of resentment, of, of the risk of living a life of resentment. And, and of course, again, Another thinker might just identify that and might say, you know, my, my opponents are resentful beings. But Roger went further than that. It wasn't just that he said, these people are resentful and they are being driven by resentment. He then went to the next stage and said, and here is a way of thinking and a way of living, which is actually the antidote to yeah. the culture of resentment you are being offered. And I think would you agree with me that very few people in our lifetimes have actually done that last stage? Some people are engaged in it, but they don't identify that they are engaged yes. in it. Yes, I, I would agree with that, Douglas, and I, I'd like to come back to that. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I remember Roger in um, I think it was in Modern Philosophy, his sort of magnum opus from the mid 1990s, said uh, talking about some of the people you you mentioned in the uh, Fools, Firebrands, and uh, uh, what, what I forget the third uh, category. Frauds. Uh, yes, uh, frauds. Um, he said, you know, these people and anyone who tells you that there is no such thing as truth or that truths are merely relative is asking you not to believe them. Mm. So don't. That's a, yes. a brilliant formulation, and yes. it's qu quite right. But I, I you know, I, I, uh, I, I want to give uh, the listeners here a uh, uh, a practical tip from Roger Scruton. Um, when he began to be attacked uh, because he was trying to help Britain build uh, beautiful buildings, uh, I mean, what a noble ambition. Why would that be controversial? But it was. Yes. It was, right? Yes. I mean, our members of parliament, you know, were, and, you know, this is a, you know, a disaster. I demand the prime minister sack him and so on. <laughs> uh, so he had two very uh, practical responses. Uh, both of which I recommend to, to your listeners if you happen to find yourself in a similar uh, position. Uh, in the first, first place, he said, I find myself horribly offended and hurt by these accusations mm -hmm. against me, and, you know, <laughs> turning the tables on them. It was, it was quite mm -hmm. brilliant. And then he said, you know, I, I know that, that I'm guilty of, of wrong think, of criminal thought. Um, most of my opinions would not pass muster with the Guardian newspaper, a very left-wing <laughs> newspaper in Britain. But, um, but you know, to make it easier for, for my critics, I am assembling a, uh, a compendium of uh, wrong thoughts that we'll post on our website. So you don't have to go to the trouble of actually reading what I said. But you can take the little, the, the, you know, and all sorts of things, architecture, you know, sex, music, uh, all kinds of things. Hunting, you know, it was, a, it was all an encyclopedia of wrong ideas. Mm. And he put them all up there, for, you know, and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I thought that was really, really mm. quite brilliant. But to come back to your, to your point, Douglas, I think you're absolutely right that um, uh, part of Roger's genius uh, as um, a philosopher, a public intellectual, was that he took his opponents uh, seriously and he, he gave the best possible account of their own ideas, which mm. in many cases, since they were fools, firebrands and frauds, was not very good. It was, he showed exactly how um, uh, uh, ridiculous their ideas were. But mm. you know, I think we've mentioned Edmund Burke once or twice uh, in our conversation so far. But Burke was really a central figure for Roger. And um, uh, what did he take from Burke? Well, many things. But one thing was uh, a suspicion of utopian thinking. Mm. You were asking, uh, you know, what was it that made these ideas attractive? Why, why would anyone 
think that uh, you know the ideas of Jacques Derrida or uh, Althusser or or Herbert Marcuse. Why would anyone take them seriously? Mm. Uh, well, because they they are really engaged in a species of fantasy. Utopia, yes. of course, is the Greek word for well. It's, it's ambiguous. It can mean either the good place or no place. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens is that left-wing disciples of, uh, of, of these gurus uh, think that they're describing a good place, but it turns out to be no place. Mm -hmm. And you see their, you see their um, uh, uh, sort of pragmatic foot soldiers on the streets burning things down now. Mm -hmm. And you see the, the, their um, intellectual arms in our our universities, our museums, and other yes. cultural institutions, which of course have been uh, entrusted with great prestige, power, financial resources in order to carry on uh, uh, the achievements of our culture. Hmm. But by some perverse logic, they have um, actually <laughs> been doing the devil's work. Instead yes. of perpetuating what is best about Western civilization, they are in fact uh, attempting to destroy it. Again, I yes. come back to that idea of the culture of repudiation. Hmm. Uh, and it was really part of Roger's genius to understand that uh, things like tradition and authority and prejudice, uh, hmm. uh, these are central Burkean terms. They are not bad things necessarily. Hmm. They are what enables hmm. uh, liberty. And some people might think about prejudice, isn't that synonymous with bigotry? But of course it's not. That is a, 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 an important Burkean point. Uh, Burke says that uh, uh, just prejudice allows a man, it renders a man's virtue his habit. Uh, all prejudice means really is that uh, you have prejudged something. Uh, on what basis? Well, on the basis of uh, custom, on the basis of the way things have been done for a long time, convention, uh, mm. and, and superficial people seem to think these are um, bad things. Yes. It was part of Roger's genius to understand that on the contrary, they are important <clears throat> spiritual enabling resources. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, by the way, before just referring to that, I should should say you mentioned uh, Roger's extraordinary book, Modern Philosophy. And for anyone yes. joining us who, who doesn't know it, uh, I, I just relate that before I read that book, I, I had that slight fear of it because it's a huge tome and it's called Modern Philosophy. And that's yeah. the sort of thing that's generally quite off-putting. Right, it should come and, with a Surgeon General's warning not to yes, operate heavy machinery while reading. <laughs> absolutely, and and yeah. and you know the book you really have to put off. On the contrary, like I think everything that Roger wrote, I, it's so extraordinarily readable, enjoyable, yeah. insightful. Uh, uh, from the moment I started reading it, I had that feeling of oh, thank goodness, it's this. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. and and that is something that I, is is worth saying. You know, I, I, a lot a, a lot of times in uh, recent months, as, as always, people have said to me, you know, what uh, what should I start with, or what should I read next in Roger's books? And I'm sure people uh, uh, who are joining and who are with us at the moment will have had versions of this themselves. I cannot hold on to a copy of On Hunting. Uh, mm. uh, um, uh, they're very hard to get hold of because uh, um, they've. Well, such I, a, I won't lend you. I won't lend you mine. No, no. I've <laughs> I've lent out so many copies, and they never come back. And that's again a very good sign. There are some people's books that you, you lend, and then they come back in no time at all, and the uh, person you've lent them to doesn't thank you. Uh, right. Roger, Roger's <laughs> books. People want to hold on to them, and right. the number of times people have said to me about that book, and as so many of Roger's books, they said thank you so much for it. And, um, and, and that is really, really is, it can't be emphasized enough, as Sophie said at the beginning, that we have uh, shelves full of books of Rogers and one of the great, um, uh, uh, one of the great things one still sort of feels about, about this is that, you know, to some extent we haven't lost him uh, um, because we have him on our shelves and uh, can pull volumes down all the time and be with him again in a sense, and that again, that, that new generations of people will have that enormous, vast and deep pleasure. Uh, just uh, what, what you referred to there about, uh, um, about both Burke, uh, architecture, much more, of course, um, this, this central truth that, that Roger was always 
um, digging away at was this, how do you defend the innate wisdom of an, an ordinary person like us who mm -hmm. has instincts, even prejudices, as you say, uh, yeah. And that their prejudices are are correct. There's a, there's a I think, semi-famous story of uh, the former MEP Daniel Hannan uh, as a mm -hmm. schoolboy asking Roger, and I've heard it from both Roger and from Dan. You know, mm -hmm. I think Roger was speaking at his school, and Dan put his hand up and asked the question. The question was something like, um, uh, "What is the job of a conservative philosopher?" And Roger said, "The job of a conservative philosopher is to explain to the general public why their natural prejudices are correct." And I remember hearing this from both sides, and it was so yeah. funny to yeah. hear that you know both of them remembered this exchange in the same way. But of course, in so many areas, Roger, as well as introducing people to new ideas and to and to and to parts of culture and other cultures that they may not have accessed, it seemed to me that part of the depth of his thought was this 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 way of identifying what was obvious to people and reminding them of why it was justified. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a there was a, a small anecdotal example of this, and I think the last public uh, uh, conversation I had with Roger, the Spectator put on la about a year or so, maybe a bit more than a year ago, uh, a wonderful occasion in London with a, just a wonderful, wonderful audience, and uh, uh, and uh, Roger said then when the subject of building came up, uh, uh, and uh, he said, you know, um, he said nobody would nobody would object if we just built Bath again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And, and yeah. the whole audience erupted in the laughter of recognition because right. it was it was it was so true and so obvious and we all knew it it's just that nobody had said it like that and and saying it like that reminded us of a great deep truth which was that we do know what is beautiful in architecture and we've been made to forget it and we have been indoctrinated with the idea that our natural instincts and our, our love of the beautiful in architecture, we've been told that it's wrong, and yes. that we're, we're in error. And, and, yeah. and so much of what he did was saying, no, you're not in error on these things. You are correct. And that's something that Burke himself, of course, also did. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he, um, Roger was really a, a very effective antidote to the shallow rationalism of someone like John Stuart Mill, who felt mm. that no uh, moral principle uh, uh, or political principle was justified unless you could provide a rational account of it. Roger mm. understood that on the contrary, um, much of what makes life worth living uh, transcends that. So mm. not only was he a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, he was also, as you say, uh, a philocolist, if I may coin the term, a lover of beauty. And he understood, uh, I, this is a deep truth, and I think it was one, one of his books on architecture. He, um, he says it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a profound mistake when dealing with human matters to believe that what is essential is what is hidden. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the contrary, it is what, uh, it, it's what has shows itself on its face. It's what it's the realm of appearance. Uh, in, in modern philosophy, he talks about that thin topsoil mm -hmm. where all that's beautiful about uh, uh, culture and civilization resides. We have to preserve that. And um, uh, uh, coming back to your, your, your book on uh, 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 Lord Alfred Douglas, I, I, it was Oscar Wilde, I believe, who said that only a very shallow person uh, doesn't judge things by their appearances. And that's, that's why right. I think that that, uh, that phrase of Owen Barfield, saving the appearances, that platonic mm. idea, is really right at the center of what Roger wanted to do. He, mm. he understood that, uh, you know, uh, a scientist will tell us that the sun doesn't really rise in the east and, 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 uh, and set in the west. That's, that's you know, for our, um, uh, you know, uh, illusion uh, being, you know, uh, bound on earth as we are. But of course, our human experience uh, tells us that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And indeed, mm -hmm. our human experience of things uh, uh, is in many ways at odds with the scientific uh, explanation mm -hmm. of things. And yes. in fact, Roger makes thematic this, this distinction between explanation, the mm -hmm. search for explanation, which is what science does, and 
the search for meaning, which yes. is something quite different. You know, uh, Aristotle yes. tells us that philosophy begins in wonder. Uh, mm -hmm. Hannah Arendt said, well, in the modern age, taking a page from Descartes, uh, philosophy tends to begin in doubt. But wonder and doubt are very similar yes. uh, uh, emotions, attitudes in, in this sense. Yes. They both insinuate themselves between us and the world, but they, mm. they have with this big difference, wonder is an, uh, an emotion of affirmation, whereas mm. doubt tends to be an emotion of uh, skepticism, of distrust. Mm. And I think that a philosopher needs both. You need to have the analytic component, but finally you need to have that affirmative uh, moment too. And it was part of Roger's genius to be able to, um, uh, even as he was analyzing things, at the same time provide uh, uh, compelling reasons for affirmation. Yes. Yes, I couldn't agree more. The, 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 I say one thing to that, which is you touched on there, which is, of course, Roger's constant approaches to perhaps the most important subject of the divine and of, of God and of religion. And it's, of course, in the period in which he was working, writing and thinking, uh, he, he was he was treading a very difficult line on this because the supremacy of the scientific idea um, uh, was both hard to critique and necessary to critique, or exactly. at least necessary to say where the magisterium did not overlap. And one of the things which uh, Roger wrote on this made a great impression on me was in a, a, um, a lecture, I think it became a chapter of a book published by the AEI, um, uh, from about 15 years ago, around the time that he was already thinking about what would become um, um, Soul of the World and others of his later writings on religion, was this central insight, which, which uh, I, I think is always worth dwelling on. He, the, he says that, of course, the problem is, is that we are told in our day that we are a specific type of being, yet which we do not feel ourselves to be the being we are being described as. Um, mm -hmm. I think he says somewhere there that, you know, we instantly revolt against, for instance, a description of ourselves as I don't know, consumers, for instance. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we revolt against it for reasons we may not be able to explain. Somebody may say, why do you mind being <laughs> described as a consumer? We may be able to say, well, we, we're more than that. But actually, of course, our revulsion to that, in the same way that there's a revulsion to being described simply as a biological entity, mm. it affects us at a very deep level because of a, of a deep sense we have that this does not explain or indeed sum us up. Yeah. So, so something else is going on. Mm. And, and that just that recognition, of course, required a considerable boldness uh, 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 to identify. And then the next thing is saying, well, what might that other thing that we intuit about ourselves then be? And all of Rogers, I think his late writings on religion really circle around this question. And I suppose also finds um, a, a personal answer in his, his writings on Wagner which he, he, he rightly sees as, as, as being just about the best um, non, not overtly religious attempt to address the same question. Mm -hmm. And of course, that question of, of that, that thing that I think Roger shared with, with Wagner to a considerable degree, that, that part of the role of thinking in the world, like creating in the world, was to re-inject that sense of the magic of the human experience yeah. and that it was so much more than what everything in our time seemed to be telling us we were. Yes. Well, I think, you know, the, the, uh, it, 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 I, I agree. And I think it's very interesting to um, ask oneself about why Roger put so much emphasis on aesthetic experience. Mm. Uh, and I think it's, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a prominent theme in, in, in his work right from the beginning, I think. And it's because he puts it someplace, um, uh, our, our experience of beauty provides us with uh, 
uh, an experience of the world saturated with meaning. Uh, mm -hmm. And one, you know, this and this is this has been um, uh, the, the key, I think, to many people who 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 uh, uh, look to art for a kind of spiritual refreshment in the mm -hmm. secular age from Matthew Arnold on down. Uh, the poet Wallace Stevens once put it thus, he said, in, 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 in the absence of a belief in God, poetry is that mm. essence which mm. serves as life's redemption. Mm. And, um, but Roger went further than that because yes. I think that he was, not, um, he was not an esthete because he understood that ultimately the, the, what really provided the grounding for this experience of a world saturated with meaning um, uh, was piety. And yeah. piety is a word, uh, it, it's, a, it's another governing word mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in, his, um, in, in his work. He, uh, it's no accident, as our Marxist friends like to say, that he provided an introduction to Joseph Pieper's, a Catholic apologist, uh, his book on, on leisure. Uh, and he points out that, that uh, uh, you know, leisure actually is, it, it doesn't, you know, we think of it as being, you know, you're just kind of, uh, skole is the Greek word our word for school. It doesn't mean that you're not doing anything. It means that you're actually involved in the highest of, yes. of pursuits. And um, I think that in the, in the end, uh, if, if, if one looks at uh, the, the, this little constellation of governing terms that we talked about, the culture of repudiation, oikophilia, um, another is, is the word loss. Because yes. Roger understood, uh, I forget which book it is now, but he, 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 he talked about the, the, the consciousness of loss and the, indeed the consciousness of, of death mm -hmm. being a uh, prerequisite for uh, uh, the appreciation of meaning in life. That without yes. that, without that understanding and appreciation of loss, the world would become meaningless and we, we would uh, lose ourselves in a... Mm -hmm. uh, to quote uh, uh, Wallace Stevens again, to the pleasures of merely circulating. So uh, it, 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 Roger managed, I think, to, to that, that very neat trick of um, uh, uh, presenting us with a world that was at once serious, but also uh, uh, joyful. Yes. He, he, he was a very uh, joyful, human, warm, mm. uh, affirmative character who at the same time understood that we are all uh, human, which is to say uh, mortal uh, uh, and uh, frail and fallible. Uh, mm. our, our friend Leszek Kolakowski, the great uh, Polish philosopher once said that religion teaches us to be a failure because in the end, of course, there is, uh, we, are, we are all failures. And I think Roger would have, um, would have uh, uh, appreciated that sentiment. Yes, I, uh, I just add one thing to that, which is uh, the the way in which Roger approached aesthetics and, uh, and and indeed and the divine was it was so interesting in recent in later years, seeing the extent to which what he had been thinking about throughout his life and had written about in great depth mm. for many decades seemed in the last few years to have reached the audience it deserved. Yeah, um, yeah, and and um, of course, it's it's also the the, the flip side of of uh, as it were living in loss that that things can be rediscovered. Uh, I, like Roger, I found um, when I was growing up, I found enormous solace in T. S. Eliot, and not just a solace, but a correction of a then existing view. Uh, uh, and the correction existed in reminding you that what has been lost can be found again. Yeah. And so much of what Roger was doing in his writing and in what he exemplified in his life was a demonstration of that. And it happened in his own life on so many things, it seems to me. And one of them was precisely this, that having spent so much time thinking about what we were losing, uh, he then found, certainly in his later years, um, that the number of people, particularly young people, who found 
this again and found it through him. Uh, anecdotally, where, um, only a couple of years ago, Roger was doing a uh, discussion with Jordan Peterson at, at Cambridge University. It was for a small audience of us. It was a like, Sam is that event. I'm sure that if Cambridge University had discovered that such <laughs> philosophy was occurring yeah. on their terrain, we would have all been turfed out. <laughs> yes. But anyhow, we had our secretive meeting and um, uh, and I was so moved because uh, I, Roger and I returned to London on the train together and 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 somebody approached him then and a young person and was asked, would said that they'd just seen his film on beauty, which somebody had mm -hmm. put up on YouTube and, and now millions of people have seen. Yeah. Um, it was it, by the way, that, that documentary, which came from his book on beauty that OUP published, I think, um, it was in a series of the, uh, other people also made programs in that series, none of which have had any afterlife. And Rogers goes on and on, on this corner of cyberspace. And he said that just that day on the train up, uh, uh, um, several people had come over to him, again, students, uh, not just all students at university, young people who had recognized him from that. And I, I found this as such a moving fact that, that again, in, in ways, I don't think that if you'd said to Roger, what are the things that you're um, you, you, would, you would imagine would be most likely to, to, to live and to, and to go out from yourself into the world and have the most impact, that, that a 50 something minute long documentary made 20 years ago would have had that effect. But there it is. And, and all, of, all of that is found by people scurrying around the internet, landing on something they recognize to speak to a truth and to mm -hmm. speak to a depth. And from there, of course, they can say, who is this person who knows these things that I myself right. intuit? And then they find out all of these other things. And so in a way, this is a demonstration of this central truth of the reason, of course, uh, contra some of Roger's suggestions of, of the importance of pes pessimism, which he wrote, of course, a famous and wonderful book right. about, is the importance of optimism on this, is the importance mm -hmm. of the fact that these things that have been lost can be found again. And that they are in the hands of people, particularly of course young people, to locate them and and to bring them back to life and to revivify those things that have been lost. Yes, you mentioned T. S. Eliot I, in the Four Quartets. I forget which one he talks about having the experience but uh, missing the meaning. We yes. had the experience yes. but missed the meaning, and I think that that recognition of of that you know that this happened but you didn't quite get it. Is is something that Roger was was very uh, adept at um, uh, uh, dramatizing for us, and um, you know there there was some uh, uh, sardonic wit who said that hope was the last evil in Pandora's box. But I think that the the sum totality of, of Roger Scruton's work shows us that uh, that that he was wrong. That it actually is an enabling uh, emotion, and uh, with that, I see that we are. Uh, uh, actually exceeding our allotted time. So I'm going to um, ask Fisher if we should keep going or turn things back over to him. Well, let's go ahead and, and jump to Q&A. &A and, and thank you both, uh, Roger and Douglas, for a wonderful conversation. We'll continue it, of course, with some of the great questions we've been receiving. I see right now we've gotten over 130 submissions for questions and, and a lot of great ones. Uh, but perhaps we might start with the most simple and basic and straightforward one. Uh, which is a, a question I've received a handful of times already, uh, but what books would you recommend one starts with if they're just getting to know Roger's work and why? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really depends. If you're a musician, maybe the, uh, uh, the aesthetics of music, the book on Wagner. Um, but I think Douglas is right. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's formidable looking, but his book on modern philosophy really is uh, a terrific mm -hmm. book. And, don't let the length um, uh, deter you. It's, it's you know, you've, I'm sure you've all, all of you have had the experience of uh, reading a novel or some other book for that matter. And, uh, and then you, you, you begin to get to the end and you get anxious because you don't want it to end. Well, th I think that book is like that a, a little bit mm. or his book, The Philosopher on Dover Beach. It's, um, mm. yeah, but Douglas, you, you might have some thoughts. Yes, I, I, um, I completely concur with that. I, uh, the one I mentioned on hunting, I've often found is is one of the best places to start. It's so wise, so funny, so self-revealing. Um, it's got so much in it, and and like a lot of Roger's autobiographical writing, uh, it, it's it's also for anybody who knew Roger, it's sort of stunning. 
because Roger was such a a, a, a generous-hearted, open person, but also but with, he was reserved. He had a he had a reserve and and an, an extraordinary dignity about himself, and he didn't I mean, he didn't gossip, you know, in the way that some of us do. And 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 I mean, he you know, enjoyed talking, of course. Yeah. But the, what my point is is that in his autobiographical writing, you would, you would often find that he had written something that you it was so moving and so so revealing, but you felt. I don't think you'd have said that to me if we were just in the room together having dinner. Right. Um, and you said it in a book. And sometimes, as Sophie's well, but sometimes it's his extraordinary beautiful description in On Hunting of Falling in Love with Sophie. Um, and and much, much more in that book. It's it's and of course in the, in, he also explains at the end how he finally understands Heidegger. And and so I've always thought that was one of the best places to start, but um I mean, England and Elegy, uh, and uh, um, uh, oh, so many, uh, so many of his books. I, I also find that some of the, uh, um, uh, I, I think that some of the, the the books, by the way, that are compilations, including Mark Dooley's superb Roger Scrooge and Reader, which includes several terrific pieces of Rogers from the New Criterion over the years, and 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 I've often dipped into untimely tracts, which is quite hard to get mm. hold of. Mm. But um, uh, Roger's friend Bob Grant mentioned that he, at uh, Roger's funeral uh, that each of those those columns from the Times in the 1980s was a sort of tightly packed pipe bomb. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it was. It does, does that include? <laughs> does that include his piece on um, Isaiah Berlin? It actually doesn't. Interestingly enough, uh, that, that, that I've, I've never read doesn't. that. I'd like to read that. Of course, yes. that was a a, a, a huge uh, a huge um, <laughs> cause. Celeste yes, at the yes. time. Uh, that, 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 uh, that, that piece is quite hard to get out. I, I, somebody with us may correct me. I don't think it is any in any of the compilations. Mm. Um, uh, of course, that was a very, um, Roger once said to me about that, it caused him such trouble. Uh, uh, you know, he assailed the person who was in some ways the absolute saint of yeah. liberal minded liberal thinking people and of course who had an enormous amount to be said for him but Roger put his finger on the most terrible and gaping question about Isaiah Berlin and he once Roger once said to me you know I I did the right thing and the wrong thing in writing that piece mm. the mm. right thing in that it was the right thing to do but for me personally it was so clearly the wrong yeah, thing scotched his academic career I mean he became yeah. a pariah overnight yeah. 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 Right. By the way, I should just add very quickly on that. A mutual friend of ours, I won't name, but uh, was once asked by Isaiah Berlin about this. It's a favorite favorite story of mine. At the very end of Isaiah Berlin's life, he said to this friend, he said, I gather you're a friend of the man Scruton. <laughs> <laughs> My friend said, Yes, yes, I am. And and he and Berlin said, he only had a few weeks to live, and Berlin said, You know what he said about me? And this friend said, Yes, I I he said that. You had been much easier on uh, um, the communist totalitarians in the 20th century than you had been on the fascist totalitarians. And uh, Berlin stopped and he looked at his friend in the eye and said, and "Do you think he was right?" And um, <laughs> and the friend in question said, in a moment of diplomacy that had never come to him before or since, he said, "Only you know the answer to that, Isaiah." Brilliant, brilliant. That's worthy of Pope Leo the First ta talking to Tilda the Hun out of sacking Rome. <laughs> That's great. Well, since we're running short on time, I'll just throw one more question. I thought it had a lovely comment too that I'd I'd read along with it, and we'll we'll close out with this. Uh, but this final question comes from Victor in Brazil. He says, "I studied with Roger at the University of Buckingham. Once in the midst of a lecture, I noticed he had his hands dirty, with black spots in between his fingers and nails from soil." as if he had just been harvesting something while working at his farm in Wiltshire, which he probably was. That image stuck in my mind as a perfect symbol of who Roger really was, a philosopher that was living in the real world in real contact with reality, and at the same time getting his hands dirty whilst plucking us all out of the depths of our ignorance. That image still brings to me the best of the memories, the best of memories, and to me it says a lot about who Roger was. I wonder if you could share any personal moments you had with Professor Scruton that is symbolic of who he was. Douglas, I'll leave that to you. Oh gosh, um, so many things. I um, we, we we've already overrunning. I know, but um, it's it's very hard for me to divorce Roger as a thinker and Roger as a friend. 
and um, like so many people who are with us at the moment, uh, he was an enormous encouragement to me and uh, and uh, just somebody you so looked forward to seeing uh, and uh, having dinner with or having a drink with and uh, always the, just the, the, the excitement of knowing how much you could roam over mm -hmm. and, and you know you always wanted to get back home and make endless jottings to yourself the things mm -hmm. you meant to read and meant to follow up and so on but really yes I, I think that, that that memory you just read out is is very typical um, uh, um, I have so many memories of Roger but uh, um, m many of them are actually of exactly that of Roger in in in, in, in the countryside and uh, the 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 visible visible enjoyment he had in being um, a philosopher and a person who was practical, and yeah. of almost defying the uh, uh, stereotype and the cliche that exists in so many uh, uh, people's minds about what a philosopher is. Um, I was very uh, very struck repeatedly by this. He he did indeed relish this, and and like so much of him, it was relishing um, people's opinions being surprised. Um, he, was, he was the world's greatest dropper of small bombs into conversation. He, he, he could just lob a hand grenade. Sometimes it was just with a couple of you, sometimes it was with a larger crowd. And for me, one of the happiest things I have of Roger is when he threw a little bomb into something, and he knew he'd done it and it hadn't yet landed and exploded and registered with the people in the room, but he knew it was about to go off. And there was a certain wonderful glee, almost, almost yeah. a childlike glee in his yeah. eyes of what he knew was coming. <laughs> like, like that Chinese executioner who finally has perfected his art. And yeah. uh, so that his next victim comes up and fellows, uh, he's, he's done. He says, well, I don't feel anything. And the executioner says, just nod your head. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. I uh, really appreciate your time today and, and you joining us for this conversation. And, and our thanks thank to you, Sophie too. as well, uh, that, uh, for uh, joining us as well. Uh, I also want to thank all of you attending today and, and for your questions and for your participation. I'm very grateful uh, for you to be here for you to be joining us and celebrating with us the launch of the Roger Scruton Legacy. Could I, could I mention one, one other thing, Fisher? Yes, absolutely. I don't think you've mentioned this yet. I believe that on the website, there is a button or, or some other device that says donate. Yes, yes, this was a great point I was just about to make, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> if you did enjoy our conversation- you, I didn't want you to leave without making yeah, no, it. Of course, well, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, if, if you enjoyed our conversation today and want to see more events uh, or uh, different programs, put forth both online and hopefully at some point in the very near future uh, in person, uh, please go to the website scrutin.org. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the donate uh, page and, and there's a, a way in which you can submit some uh, a financial contribution, which would be most grateful for to continue doing our work. As well as I encourage you to sign up for a newsletter, the column, uh, we'll be sending out some more details on upcoming events. Uh, for instance, next week we should be sending out details on our, uh, our next event, which is gonna be a series of interviews led by the uh, foundation's senior fellow in the built environment, Samuel Hughes. He'll be interviewing a couple different architects and urbanists uh, around the world uh, on the work of, of, Roger, uh, of Roger's work, excuse me, in the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission and the report they produced, uh, Living with Beauty. So with that, I thank you all for your time today. I thank you again for joining us and I wish you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.